so I started a consulting firm uh, because uh, it made sense once I started charging these incredibly high rates to have a, a team of people to also charge high rates for those people when they were uh, doing the work. And uh, amazingly, so it was in my basement. There were six of us. And, uh, and uh, eventually it, it was up to maybe 10 or 15, 20 people. Uh, when, by some kind of a miracle, we got uh, one of the biggest firms in America, uh, a fast food chain, uh, went to talk to the CEO, and he said, I love what you guys do. Tell you what, uh, I'm going to pay you. Just do whatever you want. Go look at every single part of the business. Whatever ideas you have, I'll take them. Okay? It was a perfect, perfect uh, 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 client for someone like me because I don't really know that much about business, but if I can just kind of fiddle around, sometimes I can, I can see things other people can't see. So we started with pricing, because pricing is a really, you know, something economists know about, and, and uh, it seemed like a, a great problem for a restaurant. And it turned out that, um, that uh, they didn't even price. It was really amazing to me. This, one of the biggest restaurant chains in America didn't even do their own pricing. They had a third party that, that somebody had, had, had hired who did all their pricing for them. Okay, and they just took whatever prices the third party said, and that's what they charged at their, their uh, restaurants. And uh, so we just poured through the data, and we found uh, one really interesting thing. Let me not even go into it. It's totally obvious, but it's like, the same time. Look, we found one interesting twist where there was one particular demographic feature that seemed to really predict whether uh, the, the, the people uh, uh, who frequented that restaurant were sensitive to price or not. Okay, so the key in pricing is when you have somebody who's price sensitive, you want to charge low prices. When you've got someone who doesn't care about price, you can raise the price and, and they won't be responsive. And that's the, the way to maximize profit. Okay? And we did the, but it turned out at the, on this dimension, this restaurant was charging the exact same prices on average at these two sets of restaurants. And by our calculations, they were leaving 5% of their global profit was just being lost because they weren't pricing right. Okay, so literally, if, we, if our numbers were correct, all they had to do was erase a few numbers on the different, on the different uh, menu boards of different prices, and their profits would go up by 5%. I mean, this was worth literally like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to them. Okay? And we went back, and we said, look, we might have been wrong. We're just looking in the data. Who knows? So, you know, we didn't have anything experimental. But we described to them a randomized experiment where if they would give us 100, 100 restaurants out of, you know, 10,000, and let us play with prices for three months, we could tell them with near certainty whether or not our ideas were right and whether indeed there was $100 million of profit on the table. And for it, we were going to charge them, you know, like $100,000 or something. Okay? And uh, the guy who uh, we, we pitched it to said, hey, I'm just not interested in doing it. And I said, why not? Too risky, he said. Okay, which made no sense at all. The only risk was continuing to do the same wrong decisions they had had. There was no risk at all to them of taking a few restaurants and playing around with prices. But anyway, who wouldn't do it? Like, I, I can't, I'm not in the business of convincing people who don't want to do something to do it. So uh, we moved on. Okay? And so then we went to human resources. And uh, in order to, to have a better meeting with the, the head of HR, I figured I should apply for a job at the firm uh, just to see what it was like. So I, I applied to be a burger flipper at this particular firm online. And so I did this long survey. They asked you a bunch of questions. And uh, one of the questions, uh, the, the most notable question, was, um, went as follows. It said, OK, you're wiping down the tables. I don't have the exact wording, but it's pretty close. You're wiping down a table at a restaurant when a customer punches you in the face. How do you respond? A, I punch the customer in the face back. Uh, B, I scream, call 911, call 911, I've been punched. C, I calmly stride back behind the um, counter and I inform my manager that I've been punched in the face. D, whatever, okay? So, um, so I was amused by it. So when I met the head of HR, I said, hey, I'm wondering what the right answer is to this question. And uh, she kind of laughed and said, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't really know the test very well. And I said, well, how in, how in general do you know what the right answers are? He said, oh, well, we hired Aon or Mercer or somebody, and they made up the test uh, and told us what the right answer is. I said, well, how do they know what the right answers are? And they said, well, you know, they're experts. They're business experts. They, uh, they know what the right what answers are. So I said, um, so I'm curious. Uh, I, I'm really curious whether those guys are good at their job. How closely do the answers, they say the right answers, match up? to the actual success on the job. Uh, 
And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you've, you've interviewed like 10 million people and you've hired probably 3 million people with this test. When you go back and relate attrition or promotion to the answers they give, how close are they to the, you know, to the, the patterns that, that, that Mercer would suggest? And she said, I don't know. We've never, never thought to do that. And I asked her a few questions about attrition and the cost of attrition and whatnot. And, uh, and it became clear to me that uh, uh, knowing the answer to these questions and actually using a better screening device could be worth a lot of money, like probably $25, $50 million a year to this company. And I said, well, tell you what, for you know, $75,000, my company in a week could tell you the answers to all these questions. And she said, oh, I'm not really interested in doing that. Um, that's not really my job. Uh, my job is to make sure we don't get sued for um, discriminatory practices, not really to get the best people uh, uh, hired in, in, in the restaurant. And uh, it was shocking, but look, I, I, again, I'm not in the business of trying to convince people. So we went through the organization with all these startups. And then, uh, I don't know, we've been working there for five months when, um, when I got invited to speak to the top 60 people at the entire organization. And, uh, and uh, I asked them, I said, well, I'd be happy to speak uh, to the top 60 executives, but would you rather have me tell the truth, like I could talk very frankly about what I found with your firm, but it won't be all, all happy and good, or I can just you know, talk about whatever and, and uh, make everybody feel good at the end of the day. And they said, oh, of course we, we want you to talk, you know, give us the truth. That's, you know, we're a firm that really values the truth. And uh, so uh, right before I went, I talked to my team of 20 people. So of course, this is, you know, we only have probably two clients at this point, and this is probably the best client you could ever have in many ways, and one of the biggest firms in, in, in the world. And they said, what are you going to say? I said, well, I'm going to tell them the truth. And my, you know, my employee said, no, you're not. He said, no, you can't. You hate them. They're driving you crazy. You can't tell them the truth. I said, no, I'm going to tell them the truth. So I, I got up in front of a group like this, a little smaller, and I basically just told them the truth. They did a lot of things right, but I told them the stories about how, how, how awful uh, and stuck their decision-making was. And, and what I really came to believe uh, more and more as I've uh, worked with firms is that there essentially are two kinds of firms. There's firms that, that, uh, where the managers live in a kind of a 1970s or 80s world. So to be a great manager in the 1970s or 80s, what you needed to do was to know the answers. Right? You would sit in your office, and you had to decide what the right thing to put on the menu was, what the right price was, whatever, you know, uh, uh, how to do marketing. Okay? But then something happened. There was a data revolution. And data now are available on almost everything, if you, if you look at it the right way, if you collect it the right way. And so the, the role of a manager has actually changed dramatically. Now the role of a manager is to start by saying, look, I have no idea what the right answer is going to be, okay? But I've got to surround myself with people who can tell me by looking at the data. So I have to know what questions to ask. I have to know how to think about experimentation, how to be open to ideas, and, and how to listen to customers. Uh, in ways that wasn't possible 20 years ago. Okay, and this firm had gotten stuck in the old school. They, they weren't there. So anyway, I got up there. I, I told my stories. I said, this is what happened in pricing. This is what happened in HR. I had a few other stories like that. And then I said, I really think if you want to succeed in the future, you've got to change the way you view the world and how you use data. And uh, they you know, clapped politely at the end. And uh, uh, I went back, and, and, I, and my people said, so what did you really tell them? I said, look, I told them the truth. And uh, they said, you know, they, they didn't believe me. Still, my people still didn't believe me. Uh, and they only believed me the next morning when we got an email saying that every one of our, con our contract was completely uh, ended with this firm. We were no longer uh, doing any of the projects that we were doing. And, uh, and it was weird because my reaction wasn't what you'd expect, which is, you know, oh my God, we just got fired by this huge client. We don't have any business. It was instead, uh, I, I went, first thing I did is I went out uh, to the liquor store and I bought two bottles of champagne and I brought it back and I said, hey, I have an announcement, I have a great news. Uh, we just got fired by our biggest client. And, uh, and like, of course, the people's reaction was, well, how can that be good news? And I said, look, it's good news because we have been staying up till two, not me, but they had been staying up till two in the morning, crunching data, trying to give this client answers. And they never listened to us and they never did one. I said, look, we didn't get into this for money. We did it because we wanted great problems, because we cared about you know, making a change. We wanted to learn stuff. It's just life is too short to just for money to be going out and, like, and, 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 and doing whatever this client wants, even though they never listen to us. I said, we are so lucky. There's no, we're going to find other clients, uh, but let's celebrate the fact that we learned something today. Because I said, look, this is stupid. Why didn't we wait for them to fire us? 
Why were we so blind to the obvious? It's like a John Salaji moment. It was so obvious, we should have fired them a long time ago. But it's just not in your mindset when you're a client to fire your client, when you're a consultant to fire your clients. But I suddenly realized, look, we should be in the business of firing our clients. And so I'm happy to say that over the last six or seven years, we've fired probably five or six of our 20, uh, of the 20 clients we've ever had at my firm. We've been fired by a lot more than, we've, than we have fired. So you know, we get it going both ways. But, uh, but it completely changed the nature of my firm. Because the people who worked for me up to that point, they liked it. They were kind of dedicated. But something changed that day. It was the most important, the best, really the best day in the history of my firm because they understood. Because I needed to do something. They, they could credibly see that I really, truly was happy to have been fired by that client. And I was actually angry at myself for not having had enough common sense to fire the client before then. Okay? And that changed everything. So in our, when we recruit, now you can really, people, they say what this firm is about, and they mean it, and people know it's true. And we've had unbelievable success. We've, we've made 27 offers to the best undergrads we can find anywhere competing against McKinsey and, and, uh, and, and uh, the investment banks. And 26 of the last 27 offers we made, people came to work at our firm. Because, because we built a kind of culture where people know that we really are about something, that we, we care about something. I think there's just no substitute uh, in, a, in, a, in a business for people believing that you're actually doing something that's good and important and right. That's far more important in my experience than uh, giving people big salaries. That, that, that big salaries, you're, you know, you're always one step away from losing someone, but if you really build something deeper, uh, you have a chance of keeping people forever and, uh, and really getting them not only to work hard, but to work hard and, and to enjoy it and to love what they do. So, um,